Okay, so in this mini tutorial, we're, we're going to have a, a little bit of fun doing some colouring in. Um, and we're going to colour in the various bones which form the walls of the orbit. Now, I've taken a photograph of a plastic skull and inserted it on the left hand side. Um, but, but just for your um, orientation, I'm going to quickly draw um, a, a cartoon skull, if you like. So here's a cartoon skull with the teeth in the maxilla there, um, the teeth in the mandible there, the, the, the eyes, the orbits and the um, nose. And the area which we are looking at in our photograph um, is approximately this area here. So we're looking in the left orbit um, and we're looking at it front on. So we're going to consider the bones that make up the orbit. But before we do that, I just want to emphasise to you that we can't appreciate the three-dimensionality of the orbit from a single photograph. And, and really, the orbit, it's a conical shape. So if we're considering um, this left orbit, which we've just pointed out, um, but if we did a cross-section of the left orbit in the transverse plane through uh, approximately this level here, if we did a transverse section through that left orbit, we would see that it is a cone shape, um, and, and it's a slightly skewed cone, in that the medial part is relatively flat, but the lateral wall is at a, a more oblique angle. So the orbit is a skewed cone, um, and that does have some functional consequences um, for the attachments of the extraocular muscles and also the orientation of the eyes and the visual axis. But anyway, um, enough of that. Um, let's move on and start looking at the bony walls of the orbit. Now the first bone which I would like you to consider is the large bone forming much of the roof of the orbit. So let's draw that on. Remember, this isn't a line as such, this is meant to be shading to demonstrate the boundary of the bones. So in this red colour which I'm drawing on here, um, forming the uppermost part of the orbit, the roof of the orbit, this is formed by the frontal bone. So the frontal bone is forming most of the roof of our orbit. And in fact, if you look inside of the cranial cavity, um, at the level of the orbits, you can see how the frontal bone also forms the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. So there is only a thin wall of bone between the roof of the orbit and the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. And that has important consequences for the spread of infection, um, because uh, an infection in the orbit could very rapidly lead to intracranial infection. Um, which is very serious um, indeed. The second bone which I'd like us to consider is forming a large part of the lateral wall of the orbit um, and this is the zygomatic bone. So the zygomatic bone is forming a large part of the lateral wall of the orbit which we've coloured in here. Now clinically the zygomatic bone is um, very important, um, it forms part of the zygomatic process which um, frequently gets fractured um, if someone say falls on their face or takes a blow to the face because it's relatively subcutaneous um, and it's quite easily broken. So that's the zygomatic bone in blue. Next in green we're going to consider a, a very important bone from the point of view of the orbit and that is the maxilla. Now the, the maxilla um, forms a large part of the floor of the orbit as I'm going to demonstrate to you now. So this is the maxilla forming the floor of the orbit here. And also remember it's forming a large part of the uh, front of the face as well. So 
this here um, is the Magzilla. Um, we'll just change to a larger pen to colour it in fully. And the Magzilla is clinically really important when thinking about the orbit because that portion of the Magzilla which is forming the floor of the orbital cavity um, this bone here which I'm colouring in now is incredibly thin really really thin indeed and that's important because if you were to take a blow to the eye um, what could actually happen is that this bone on the floor of the orbit could fracture and the eyeball could drop down into the maxillary sinus which is sitting immediately beneath the orbit. So this area of bone is very very thin indeed um, and you could get what's known as an orbital blowout fracture where the eyeball literally drops down into the maxillary sinus sitting beneath. Um, and remember also that the maxilla has um, nasal processes extending up towards the frontal bone here as well um, so it has not only important relations to the eye but also um, important relations to the nasal cavities as well. The next important bone encircling the outermost part of the orbit we need to consider is the lacrimal bone and the lacrimal bone um, is very important since it contains the nasolacrimal duct which assists with the drainage of tears and um, it's a very small irregularly shaped bone um, and we can see just about in this region here all right so the lacrimal bone sits just about here um, and immediately anterior to the lacrimal bone is the maxilla so there's the rest of the maxilla there okay so we've got the lacrimal bone in purple. Going deeper into the orbit now and focusing on the medial wall, we've got a very important bone which is irregular in shape. Um, and if you look at an isolated one of these, it's, it's quite has quite a honeycomb texture. Um, and this is the ethmoid bone. And when I say it's got an, a honeycomb texture, I really do mean that it is it is paper thin, just like honeycomb, and very easily damaged. Um, and the ethmoid takes up this area here roughly so the ethmoid is roughly in this region here um, and it's sitting on the medial wall of the orbit um, and inside that ethmoid bone through this paper thin bony partition are the ethmoid air cells um, which are important paranasal sinuses and once again if the ethmoid air cells were to become infected, um, it would be relatively easy for infection to pass through that very thin bony wall into the orbit sitting just lateral to the nasal cavity. The final bone which I want to draw your attention to is the sphenoid. Now, the sphenoid is probably the most important bone in the skull. It's a central bone and connects to many, many other bones and contributes to many cranial regions. Uh, and the sphenoid um, is important to the orbit, not just because it forms the posterior wall of the orbit, but also because it contains um, the major foramina, um, which supply the orbit with vessels and nerves. So here we are colouring in the sphenoid bone. Here. So this is the sphenoid, and you can see within the sphenoid we have some um, important foramina. Here is the optic canal, and here is the superior orbital fissure. Furthermore, you can see that we've now formed, between the sphenoid and the maxilla, the inferior orbital fissure. Finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to a tiny, tiny bone um, forming a small part of the wall of the orbit towards the back. And that's that small patch in brown that I've drawn there. And that's the part of the orbit formed by the palatine bone. 
Now the palatine bone isn't all that significant really as far as the orbit is concerned. Um, it's an L-shaped bone which makes its biggest contribution to the walls of the nasal cavity and the hard palate. But it does just make a small contribution right at the back of the orbit between the ethmoid and the maxilla. So I hope that this very brief tour of the orbit has been beneficial for you. Um, but please be aware that this is no substitute um, for examining a real skull in the dissecting room and making sure that you've got a full appreciation of the three-dimensional relationships between the individual bones. Okay, thank you.